and said, I know that you're horrible, but I know what kind of God I serve. I mean, it's not all Welcome back to, again, what I hope has been an incredible time for us conversing this entire month as we've been dealing with Unfriended. And really, the aim has been how can we not allow the breakup to break us down? Uh, as we've been journeying over the last few weeks, I want to thank you so much for you tuning in. I appreciate your feedback. I really appreciate the fact that many of you have been very transparent and talk about, hey, look, Pastor, I know what it is to deal with breakups, and I must admit that I haven't always managed them in the right way. I got an interesting question this week. Someone said, Pastor, what, what made you come up with the idea for this series to be entitled Unfriended? Well, I would tell you what spurred this for me was longtime friend that we had been together. We had been homeboys for a long time. We had been in each other's lives for a while, but we had kind of fallen off, hadn't talked as much as we used to. And one day, just randomly, I said, well, let me just go check on them. So I went to his Facebook page, and there I noticed that I was unfriended. I didn't hear anything. I didn't know anything. I called one of our mutual friends. I said, look here, man, will you go check it out? And he said, goody, check this out. I got unfriended too. And I thought to myself, there has to be a better way. Whatever it was, there needs to be something better than just to let it in, just to not even address the reality of whatever happened. That relationship should be strong enough to manage moments when there needs to have a necessary ending. And so today, I really want to just kind of come to this moment as we've been conversating together. And part of the emphasis that I've really been using for this series is a major book by Henry Cloud. And it helped me some years ago, not even necessarily in relationships, but it was also helping me as I was trying to discern how do I manage staff transitions and those things. And Henry Cloud has a book entitled Necessary Endings. And it's a book that makes endings a lot easier by explaining why they're necessary and how to carry them out. I, I, would, I would encourage you, if you get an opportunity, it's a wonderful book to at least have in your library because there will be necessary endings in every aspect of life, not just in personal relationships, on jobs, and a lot of different things. But there are three main lessons that I glean from that particular book. And I will say, number one, lesson one, was focus on your goals to help yourself prune those things that are holding you back from reaching your full potential. That's something we can glean from that particular reading. But lesson number two is make it easy to start changing your life by getting the urgency that comes from looking hard at your current circumstances. I'm going to dive into that a little deeper today in this conversation as we continue to talk about necessary endings but then also the third lesson is overcome hurdles to breaking off relationships by setting standards and realizing what you hope will happen after the separation. For many of us, we can be so enthralled in it that we fail to understand that there is life after it. And we can be so moved by it that we become paralyzed in the now, not realizing that beyond the separation needs to be a productive and prosperous not yet. Ending relationships is particularly difficult. Most of us are more in love with the idea of being in love than with the people we think we're in love with. It's easy to stay comfortable, listen, in what we know, even if that is bringing us down. But sometimes, even what seems like the best relationships, best opportunities, must come to an end. Over the last few weeks, there are some things that I, I have purposely not wanted to deal with overtly, even though many of you have infuse your own situations and relationships and opportunities in what I've been talking about. But when I think about breakups and I think about endings, there are three most difficult endings that I could, could think through are divorce, are death, and even departures. Now, to think about divorce, I, I, as a pastor, I will admit that I hear about it all the time. Matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, the world was shocked. Not only did you have the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, get divorced, but then even Bill Gates and his wife, after 20-some years of marriage, got divorced. And the conversation all rampant on social media, if they couldn't stay married, then who can? They had more money than you could ever dream to do with in multiple lifetimes. But somebody that knows marriage doesn't keep a marriage together. Matter of fact, here's the reality. And this is where I think we need to be frank about it. I hope one of these days, I, I would love to do a series on this because the statistics say right now, 50% of marriages end in divorce. One out of two, period. 
statistically. That's not just outside the church. I can make the argument that that number is even higher in the church. People that love the Lord and supposedly love one another finds it difficult to be in divorce. Matter of fact, I, as a pastor, I oftentimes have to counsel people because there is sometimes guilt and shame associated with divorce. And trust me, I want you to know the grace of our God is greater than any kind of issue or divorce or ending. So I need to give you some space because there's still some people that have been wrestling because you feel like you let God down or you feel like you let others down because you came to a decision. And those things are not taken haphazardly. And I want you to understand that God extends that grace to us. And as a pastor, I've seen divorce happen in a multitude of ways. And even from a spiritual aspect, people always ask me, well, Pastor, what are some of the reasons that you've seen or, or that you look at that divorce seems to be the option? Well, it's the four A's for me. And I've seen divorce come because of A, adultery, a breaking of the covenant. I've seen it be abuse when there just comes to the point, whether that's physical, mental, or whatever type of abuse. I've seen it in abandonment. You'd be amazed how many people in covenant have been abandoned. But then also, fourthly, is addiction. That sometimes addictions may come in and things, whether it's narcotics or whatever the addiction may be. I've seen it even with pornography. There's a lot of variety of reasons. And I have time to parse them out. I would hope that we can dive a little deeper in this. But I need you to understand that these are realities and these are things that happen that lead us to make that hard and difficult choice of divorce. I mean, if you think about it, most of the commonly reported things we hear are lack of commitment, infidelity, conflict, and arguing. And honestly, the final show that I hear most often is whether it's infidelity or domestic violence or these other things that we share. And here's the truth. More part participants blame their partners than blame themselves for the divorce. Here's a staggering statistic. The average age of divorce is 30. But here's the other crazy thing. The fastest growing rate of divorce demographically are people who've been married 25 years plus. There's a lot of different factors in that. But that can be a very hard and difficult ending to deal with. And I could make the argument, no matter how much you may despise them, no matter how hard they put your life through, divorce is hard and difficult because it's a literal death. From a spiritual standpoint, to divorce is ripping apart flesh. Because coming together, marriage, the Bible says, is when one comes with another and they join their fleshes together. It's difficult. So divorce is hard. It's a difficult ending. But I want you to know that another difficult ending is death. Now, I know you don't think about it, but death is an ending. The trauma of losing someone through death can be devastating. Can I be honest with you? I see it all the time, and even I had to deal with it personally. When my grandfather passed in 2008, it stung. It hurt to the no end. Matter of fact, I still wrestle with that grief. And when I went to counseling about it, in the midst of my sessions, this was what's unearthed. I was angry at my grandfather. I was angry, not the fact that he died, but through death, he left me. And for many of us, that can be the challenge as we're trying to wrestle with those weird emotions. There are some who have had people die and you didn't have the opportunity to say final words. Or maybe there's someone that, that it didn't end correctly and you didn't know that that would be the last time you see them and then they transition. Death can be a hard ending to grapple with, to try to figure out emotionally and mentally and physically and it's a long journey. There are many of us who are in this conversation today who've been wrestling with that trauma that you just don't know what to say because you can no longer speak to them like you used to, can no longer have conversations. There's no longer an opportunity to reconcile anything that may have went wrong. Divorce is tough. Death is difficult. But then also departures. <laughs> I've been looking and seeing all these celebrations. I've been seeing people who graduated from high school and college. I've been seeing all these things that have been going on. But you know, in the midst of those celebrations, they can be laced with sadness and pain. See, most people don't think about this, but permanently leaving a place, whether that be people or jobs, school or whatever, can be very devastating. 
I know you don't think about it because you're only thinking about the next, but can I admit to you that in some of my most celebratory moments and places that I've, I've graduated from, I haven't seen many of them since. I haven't had a chance to go back to tell my professor how much they impacted me. There are some classmates that walk with me, that sat on the same row with me that I haven't seen in 20 years. And I know we don't think about it in the moment because we're celebrating. We're ready for the next. I know when I was in college, I couldn't wait to graduate. And I want to give a word to those who are graduating from college. I'm telling you, being an adult is overrated. Hear me clear. Soak in that last few bit, if you will, because that real world is a real world. And so maybe it's a situation, maybe it's life that I was used to, maybe it was a freedom that I no longer have, being grown. And so oftentimes we don't think about how those affect us. Divorce and death and even departures. But then the critical question is raised. And it's where I want to land for the few moments that we have to conclude this conversation. How do we say goodbye? Is there a proper way to say goodbye? As hard as goodbyes are, I want to lift up something from the Bible that shares with you and I the proper way to say goodbye. Even in hard moments, things that we perhaps may not want to end, when a goodbye is inevitable, there's a right and wrong way to do it. And I want you to go, as we've been looking over these last few weeks, I've been very intentional to highlight some biblical instances of breakups, whether it's Abram and Lot, Jacob and Laban, Abigail and Nabal. I wanted to share some things that I hoped and prayed would be important. Paul and Barnabas. Because I need you to know that the Bible covers these moments. The Bible doesn't just cover our good times. It also covers some of our tense, frustrating seasons of life. And as a goodbye that we see found in Acts chapter 20. And it involves two, two entities. One, Paul the great apostle, and the second is a group of people, the Ephesian elders. It is in this text from Acts 20, you can read it when you get home, that's your homework this week, it's verse 17 to 38, it gives this narrative and story of Paul saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders. Now to put context on it, understand this, although Paul had been with them for over three years, he was a church planner. And he knew moving from one place to the next was necessary to continue to advance the gospel. But while he was gentle in his conversation with the Ephesian elders, he was clear in his assignment. Just like Paul, you and I know when it's time to say goodbye. I mean, come on, we know the truth. We know when that moment comes. One of the things I want to caution you as we dive deep into this is don't allow your emotions to stop you from saying a goodbye that you know needs to be said. It's okay to grieve a goodbye, even when you knew it was coming. Don't let anyone shame you out of your grief. I hope that in the times we have been sharing together that you've been filling my heart. This is not to give us shame, but it's also to give us space to know these are hard moments. Saying goodbye, separating something, coming to an end is not easy. I'm afraid of people who say it didn't affect them. It does affect you. It affects all of us. It affects us in some ways, and some is more overt, and some is more covert. It doesn't matter. In some way, it's going to affect you. How you respond is really you. When you leave properly, here's the reality. Your reputation will remain intact long after you go. Some things that I want you to pick up from these conversations that we see is your method of saying goodbye should never compromise your morals and your integrity. And how you choose to say goodbye can have a lasting impact on the legacy you leave behind. How you manage this season has repercussions and reverberations in multiple seasons from here on out. Don't get so caught up in the pain of the goodbye that you forget to appreciate the memories that were made. In this story that I want to share... Paul had to be intentional about leaving a blueprint for others to follow. And you have to be passionate enough about what you've been connected to to make sure it is able to thrive after you disconnect from it. Can I tell you one of the things that I've been praying through and why I felt this was important to have this real meaningful conversation? Is that true maturity says that even though a goodbye is inevitable, I don't wish ill will nor do I want to be bitter 
I want us to be better. And can you honestly say that the places and people and situations you leave are better that you're gone? Now, I know no matter what happens in the process of it, there are always extenuating circumstances, but let's be real. If we know endings are necessary, the truth is part of my spiritual maturity is hoping that you are better in my absence than you were in my presence. Let me lift up some things. There, there are some things in this particular passage. I, I've been really trying hard to be as practical as possible. And I want to look at how Paul says goodbye. I want to look at, at the process he does, the, the proper way he begins to share this idea, how he begins to go through this whole saying of goodbye. First thing that I see Paul does is that, that when we do goodbyes the right way, we acknowledge the effort that was put in. That when you are saying goodbye the right way, First thing you must do is acknowledge the effort that was invested in the relationship. If you read these verses, you'll know that Paul was honest about the struggles he faced during the time he was in relationship with the Ephesians. In other words, what he was saying is that, listen, this hadn't always been an easy relationship. Me trying to teach you, me trying to invest in you, me trying to pour into you. There were some challenges. There were some issues. This was not a perfect situation but one that we mutually progress through. And what I really expect about Paul is he made sure to keep his commitment to keep preaching to and teaching the Ephesians. In other words, this is what I appreciate about Paul, that even in the rough times, he stayed committed to doing what was needed to invest in the Ephesians, even when they didn't treat him right, even when he felt not valued enough, he did not allow their opinions and things that they do to stop him from maintaining his fidelity to his assignment to them. Despite his own issues with his opponents, he still gave the Ephesians everything he had. Paul teaches us that while goodbyes are not always easy, they are easier when you know how you have given a relationship everything you can. That it may be hard, but I have no regrets. It's difficult, but I poured my entire self into this. So my goodbye is not easy, but it's easier because I know what I invested. Paul had close relationships with the people he was teaching. He preached to them and taught them in public and in their homes. One thing that we realize in this relationship between Paul and the Ephesian elders is a relationship can be going well, and it can be a close relationship while still not being a lifetime relationship. It does not mean that the relationship did not have value. No, stop expecting just because something didn't last long that it did not have value. Not every valuable relationship in your life will be a lifetime. It simply means that it was not supposed to last forever. Truth is, the matter is, you see that when you go to your refrigerator, you do realize everything you put in there can be good, but everything has an expiration date. And just like that in your refrigerator, same thing can happen in a relationship. Relationships are not just one-sided endeavors, but there's this mutual giving and taking that shows that we can't just rely on one person or one party to keep things going and alive. Even in the midst of transition, their relationship has withstood the trial. Things we put in relationships are not to just be understood as a one-time thing, but is an ongoing process of growth, honesty, and maturity. Relationships take time, take attention and energy, but also take endurance and openness and courage. It was once said that well-produced music knocks at a low volume. The relationship translation is simply this. Your relationship does not have to be loud to be fulfilling. I was reading a, a news article the other day, um, and I've been really trying. Y'all pray for me. I'm trying not to be on a lot of these news articles because they can be so depressing. But I read a very interesting article on CNN that talked about this employee at a hospital in southern in Italy that received 15 years worth of pay despite never showing up for work. 
It was an interesting article that went on to talk about how much this person had pocketed and the people investigating realized that this moved up the hierarchy, that somehow, some way he had just filtered through the, the system. That here's what got me was that he was paid for something he never showed up for. And many times in relationship, there will be regret if you are trying to put in something but never are present. And maybe we might be like this employee in southern Italy. We're receiving benefits for stuff we don't show up for. I want you to notice that you've got to acknowledge the efforts that you put in, that the proper way to have a good goodbye is that. But also number two, be honest about the things that have changed. And here might be one of the hardest things that we wrestle with. The reality of life is this, no matter where you are, can I be honest, things change. You're not going to be the same person you were yesterday or last week or last month or last year. Matter of fact, for many of us coming through this pandemic, let's be honest, everything has changed. Problem is there are some people who assume that the pandemic was an interruption instead of a disruption. We won't even know the full ramifications of what we've been through, the emotional and the mental and the spiritual toll. That has hit us. But one thing that is certain, <laughs> things change. Sometimes transition is because of something that we've done or something we failed to do. But here the transition is not something either have done or have failed to do. But really when you look at this particular story between Paul and the Ephesian elders, it was a shift in perspective and a shift in place. I saw an interesting tweet the other day, and I want to share it. It says, stop wearing your wishbone where your backbone ought to be. Because many times we wish for things to be. But true reality in relationships and anything we do is going to take courage. You can't wish things to be the same because at some point of life, things will change. But Paul in Ephesians knew he was not supposed to stay in Ephesus forever. This was known from the beginning. And while Paul was preparing himself for a final goodbye, the Ephesians had not. Here's the reality. Being honest about the nature of relationships make necessary endings easier to digest and manage. Truth of the matter is, I know many people, and we all can be guilty of this, is assuming something is what it's not. And trying to label something that we know in our heart was not meant to ever be what that was. I always think back to the thing in creation when, when, when God was preparing Adam for leadership and dominion. The first thing he did was bring animals by and gave him the ability to name what he saw. Part of the first ideas of discernment is calling it what it is. And you and I must make sure that we're not naming something forever that we know is only for a season. Notice his words that Paul says, I don't know where or what will happen to me there. He's speaking about him as his future movement. Words that come to mind is fear. I mean, think about it, confusion and anxiety. We often have more fear for what we don't know rather than what we must give up. And sometimes it's easy to give up things. But it's harder to be honest when your honesty is rooted in a lack of clarity. It's an interesting point. Oftentimes people say that we must have clarity before we move. But notice in this text, we see that clarity is in the moving. What if I told you, you won't see God's next step until you take the step? God can show you what you're going into if you're still stuck in what he's trying to get you out of. How do we move on? I need to pause here because I think that part of the moving on is hard. Let me be real with you, and this is a hard one, so I need you to lean in close to your screen on this one. Many times, an apology is needed to move on. <laughs> Sometimes the biggest communication problem is we do not listen to understand. We only listen to reply. And maybe in this moment of transition, if your apologies don't go over well, maybe it's because you're not saying the right thing. Think about it. In an apologies, and we've all been guilty of this, we don't always say the right thing. Here's some, here's some things about what not to say. 
Haven't you gotten over that yet? I'm sorry that you were offended. I asked for and received forgiveness from God. You know, we love to bring God into it. And why do you always? But maybe what we should do is say, I did it and I have no excuse. I'm responsible for the mistake. It may take us a long time to move on from what I've done. I would have a hard time forgiving me if I were you. I've damaged your trust. Can you ever forgive me? During the beginning portion of this year, th there was a news story that I think went under the radar. It affected all of our lives and we didn't even know it. <laughs> there was a shipping container called the Ever Given that ran aground in the southern part of the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal, it separates Africa from the Middle East and Asia, and it's one of the busiest trade routes in the world. Matter of fact, it has been estimated over 20% of global trade is done through this canal, but for weeks, this ship was stuck. And because it was stuck, nothing could go through. It couldn't change. It was interesting. If you watched it, you'll note that this was blocking the pathway. Nothing could go in and nothing could go out. And the simple reason was something that was meant to pass through was stuck. And I wonder how many of us have an ever given in our relationship. Something that's just languishing there. We can't move on. We're stuck. We can't be productive because we're not doing the hard work to maneuver and manage and get it out of the way. I, I appreciate Paul and those, and this is hard. I'm not telling you something that's easy. For all of us, me included, we wrestle with that because it's hard to say I'm sorry for something you don't feel sorry or that you did. But in the midst of it, can I be honest, and this is the truth in every relationship, not everybody's a victim. And there are parts that every one of us play in certain aspects of the relationship. Maybe the thing that you need to move on is a simple apology. You can't change it, can't turn back the hands of time, but I wonder how much good and peace we would receive over a simple I'm sorry. Something else I see, I hope I'm not boring you. Talk about the things that we are afraid of. In this conversation, Paul has with them, not only acknowledges what they invested, not only is he really telling them that it's time for him to move on, the transition season is there, but there's a vulnerable moment where Paul has to share with them some of the realities of some fears that he's having. Not only just for his move, but for them in his absence. The difficulties in this text is not just for Paul, but it's also for these people. Here's the truth. Let's be honest. There is danger for all of us when we transition. I've learned this, that for many of us, transition can be one of the hardest things. It can be hard. I was talking to a friend of mine. He was trying to pick my mind. They were considering going back into in-person worship. And I made this statement to him. I said, 2020 was hard, but 2021 is going to be even more difficult. He said, Goody, what you mean? I said, here it is. In 2020, we had to move, then think. In 2021, we got to think, then move. We're going to have to pivot. Anybody plays any sports knows that the pivot moment is a moment that you can get injured. To pivot, hard stop, to change directions can put a lot of pressure on vulnerable places. And that's what Paul is saying in this moment of transition. Listen, there's danger for injury. And if you don't mind how you pivot, if you don't guard yourself and your heart in transition, let's be honest, I know, I know you're not going to say it out loud, but how many of us made some bad decisions in transition? How many of us have done some things we regret in a rebound moment. In this text, Paul knew that the Ephesians would never see him again. And he wanted them to know this is it. Goodbyes are more difficult when they are laced with false hope. 
The reality is set a realistic expectation regarding future reunions and be okay with some people knowing your goodbye is final. Paul was basically saying, listen, you're going to want to see me, but you can't. This needs to be it for your health and for mine. So listen, when you get lonely, don't call me. When you start missing me, find something else to do. Matter of fact, let me help you. Race my number out your phone. I mean, whatever you got to do because he's being honest. He said, listen, guys, we can no longer see one another. And how many of us keep praying for a reunion after goodbye? If there was a need for a reunion, you wouldn't need to have to say goodbye. Paul reminded them of all he taught them and made sure they understood that they were now accountable to God based on what he taught them. Part of the responsibility in saying goodbye is making sure those connected to you understand they're accountable for their own well-being based on what they have learned for you. Basically what he was saying, and I appreciate this, Paul was saying, this ain't time to go back. A lot of progress has been made. We've matured. Don't go back to where it was. I know you're focusing on the hurt right now, but take these life-giving lessons. And from this point forward, watch this. Don't go backwards, go forward. Paul prepared for the people for what he was to come after he left. He knew the trials they would face and cared enough for them to want to make sure they were well once he was gone. Here's something that I need you to understand. And most people have a hard time with this. But what Paul teaches you and I is the real, real truth. Saying goodbye does not mean you no longer care for someone. You can't turn off your emotions. We're not robots. No, not at all. And even though you realize a season has changed, doesn't mean that your heart will agree. Sometimes you got to drag your heart into the next season, crying, frustrated and tension. You just can't turn that off. It means you have acknowledged that your journey with them has come to an end. That's okay. Be honest about that. Stop trying to be hard. No, it hurts. You care. They did you wrong, but you care. It's time to move on, but you care. You can't turn that off. And oftentimes we get in trouble because we want to be just hard and strong. I can do it. I, I, no, take your days. You need your little time? Take your time. Stop trying to move on so fast, not even dealing with it. One of the regrets that I have in life and ministry, I'll be honest with you, and I don't have many, but one I had is the same week that I buried my grandfather, his funeral, he died on a Tuesday. His funeral was that Saturday. I'm grateful for an amazing church that came in large numbers to support. But my silly tail got on the road and came back to Tab and preached the next Sunday morning. I thought to myself, well, if I just get back to doing what I do, I'll be all right. I, I'm fine because this is what I do. And I'm telling you, that thing knocked me off for at least three, four additional years. I should have been smart enough and wise enough and mature enough to say, I need some time. I need to heal. I need to wrestle with these emotions. And the truth of the matter is, for many of us, we keep going through the motions because you think you're going to work your way through it. And so what we do is we get busier and busier. And so we put more stuff on our calendar and we just push everything aside. And here's the truth. The more you push it down, the more you try to put it out the way, that's when some moments can happen. When you least expected that thing that you thought you had gotten rid of, that thing that you put aside and hid in the drawer of your heart can come up at the wrong time. Can I tell you? Take time to heal. At the end of the day, that's what happens. Paul warns them it would be easy to, feel, to think through and to try to spiritualize this text, but we must make it as human as we possibly can. In this text, Paul is simply saying this, I'm afraid that the good you have to offer will be diminished because of the bad that others will bring. He said, this is my thing. If you don't properly heal, then you'll put that hurt heart in the wrong hands. And you'll make bad decisions that healed people don't make. 
But at the end of the day, this is what Paul says. He says, I entrust you to God. This is powerful. I love this because at the end of the day, all we can do is the best we can and hope for the best possible outcome. All we can really do is leave something behind that people can hold on to, that they can remember, and they can live in light of. Once you have done your part, you can't control somebody else. Paul knew God would continue to show up in the lives of the Ephesians long after he was gone. When you've had to say your final goodbye, hear me clearly, trust God to do what he does and show up in the spaces even though you are no longer there. That was a critical moment for the disciples of Jesus. While they were in relationship with Jesus, they wanted to be around Jesus. They were with him, eating with him, seeing his miracles. But even though they were in denial, Jesus knew he was not going to be there long. And this is what Jesus told them. I got to leave you. And one of the hardest conversations Jesus had to have with the disciples, he was clear, I'm, I got to leave you. But God will never leave your presence without something to help you. The Holy Spirit. Paraclete. And in that moment, it began to speak to me because for many of us, you think that you can't live without them. Yes, you can. You think that now things will never get better. You, you will never experience prosperity. No, yes, you will. I, I'm always be like, that. no, 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 you're going to be okay. Listen and hear me clearly. Just like Jesus understood to those despairing disciples and Paul understood to those Ephesian elders, you're going to be all right because God will give you what you need. Don't you keep assuming that things are over. You need strength for this next season. And God is so faithful that he'll give you what you need even when you don't know what you need. Someone needs to hear this. There is life after the divorce. There is life after the resignation. There is life after something ends. God will never leave his children unaffiliated and unoccupied. God will give you what you need. Here's the final thing I give you. Pray and be on your way. Simple. I'm done. That's my final portion to you. Pray and be on your way. Paul ran down his more resume to the Ephesians, pointed out how he always treated everyone fairly, never taking anything from anyone, and worked for all he had received. Some goodbyes will require you to remind those you're leaving of your character so the narrative surrounding your impact can be changed once you are gone. Now, I know you're going to run out in the streets and post something crazy, but let's be real. I've been good to you. We had some good time before you start. Trying to belittle me. No, we had some good times. So if you're going to tell the story, tell the whole story. Don't, 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 don't just give part of it. No, tell the whole story. Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the final thing he did in the midst of their wailing and crying, Paul prayed with the Ephesian elders before he left. Don't be so hasty to say a permanent goodbye that you're not prayerful about the people it may affect. I'm praying for you. Paul was good at goodbyes. We see that in his life. I will admit that's something I wrestle with. But he still understood the need to love people through their challenges with the endings of a relationship. Here's my final thought to you. In your goodbyes... Be considerate of the feelings of the people you're disconnecting from. It's hard. Goodbyes are difficult. Nobody wants to deal with them, but they are part of life in the process. Over the last few weeks, I've been sharing that with you. And I really hope that I've been challenging you and all of us to navigate what it means to say goodbye. That's what happens. And if you and I have been trying to figure out in these conversations the value of our peace, the fact that sometimes you're going to have to put a stone between you and them, there's some fools and foolish things you're going to have to release yourself from, and yes, the truth of the matter is there will be others who will get in the middle. 
Today, I really wanted to conclude this conversation, this master class, if you will, on breakups. Pray, God, give me the strength to say goodbye the right way. Endings happen. But the true prayer is no matter what happens in breakups, next seasons and transitions, you want both sides to be better. It's a poor, immature person who wishes ill will on any individual in any situation. Once you're gone, it's fine. I want you to do well. I look back over my life, there's some people through relationships, through opportunities, that even though I may not say it, I'm grateful to see how good God is in their lives. Because God has been good to me in my life. Every goodbye in my own life has been monumental. It's made me appreciate things. It's made me stronger. I wouldn't be the man, the pastor, the leader I am without the endings that I've had to endure. And I don't believe that God would waste an ending to mature your purpose and your power. So my prayer through all of this is don't allow the breakup to break you down. Before the foundations of the earth were even formed, God knew what struggles you were going to go through. He knew what people would come in and what people would leave. Trust me, these endings didn't surprise God. But what I want to pray with in this last moment is release yourself from the shame of necessary endings. If it's divorce, if it's loss of a job, if it's a death, if it's a departure, whatever it may be. Say, God, give me grace to know there is life after this. That's what I simply wanted you to know. There is life after breakups. There is progress after breakups. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray. We thank you for those who, who have been sharing over the last few weeks in this master class as we have been navigating what it means to be unfriended. So God, I hope and pray that the principles that we have been sharing have been helpful and beneficial to let us know that we should not allow any breakup to break us down. God, do the hard heart work. Let us, in a mature way, navigate these moments. And even based upon today's final concluding message, teach us the proper way to say goodbye. So Lord, I'm praying for everyone out there. I'm praying that you would once again touch their hearts. Even in difficult transitory seasons, give us the space and the power to walk according to your will. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Listen, I hope that the word has been helpful. I want to give you opportunity to connect. Anytime we share the word of God, it is simply because we are excited about your future and we look forward to partnership, not only with Christ, but also with his church. Once again, you see the multiple ways on the screen for how you can connect with us. Text that word connect to the number there or even email us at connect with us at tbcaugusta.org or even go to our website, tbcaugusta.org. Matter of fact, to even make it more practical and applicable right there in the comment section. If this has helped you, go ahead and put that in the comment section. And our tab our team uh, would love to engage with you. We also have a live Zoom room of connection, people who are ready to talk with you. This has been a very powerful series, but I also know it has been a triggering series. And I hope and pray that you'll once again do the necessary work. It's not easy. So even let us know. There are trained people who can help us through these different seasons of life. Don't feel like you've got to go through them by yourself. I don't want you to harm yourself over something that God was trying to grow you through and not destroy you in. So I want to give you that opportunity. So listen, you see the multiple ways to do that? Make that connection, and I'm grateful for you. Listen, guys, I hope and pray that you stay safe. It is our aim that in this season, as we're starting off the summer, uh, that we continue to be diligent about the things that we're doing. Uh, we are looking forward to when the moment shall come for reentry once again. Make sure you fill out that Remerge survey. It's going to really help us and give us some pertinent information. We know things are always changing, but we're looking for in-person workshop at our local conditions and things that's happening within our local area. And right now, I think below 20% of people are vaccinated. So hopefully that number will get up. We'll see more of the science, but be careful watching the national news and make sure that you're watching the local news 
news and get your local information. But I look forward to seeing you. I promise you, it's going to be here before you know it. Listen, I love you guys, but God loves you best. We say this all the time because we've been blessed. We're going to be a blessing. Take care. Yo, what's up, Take I fam? We are so glad you joined yes. us once again mm -hmm. for another Tap Global Experience. Yes. Uh, that word, that concluding it word was. of our series, Good. Unfriended, was mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. And we pray that in this moment where we kind of, you know, went into a different shifting yeah. of preaching in mm -hmm. this season, we pray that you were challenged and convicted, but yes. also encouraged and mm -hmm. embraced uh, as we all learned together. We did, and that was a powerful sermon series. Also, it's just a final reminder, not a final reminder, but just a reminder for all our students and all our graduates, please go to the website and complete um, your applications for your accomplishments so we can recognize you in June, because we want to be excited for you and all the things you Amen. accomplished this year. We're proud. Oh, yes. We're really proud. We want you to know that we are proud of you, all your graduates, and all the students that have accomplished so much in this year, just Despite COVID, despite, yeah. you know, virtual learning That's and everything, y'all did it. That's 100. And we're excited. So please make sure you go and complete that information. That's close the word, close, close the word. word. On, that, on that topic of uh, the way, you know, students have learned this mm -hmm. year and adjusted and even yes. parents and administrators yes. and mm -hmm. faculty and staff. Exactly. You know, I think as we look back over this moment, over mm -hmm. this year moment, uh, we're still here. Yes, we are. And, and somehow we have found a way to adapt and to yes. adjust. Yes. And I think I think that's a word for us. It is. Like, don't downplay your ability. That's true. Uh, don't. To adapt and adjust mm -mm. in the way that you have learned how yes. to overcome. That's lovely. So embrace that and yes. celebrate yourself and exactly. celebrate others mm -hmm. because we here and we did it. We did it. All right, Tab I fam. Love you. Take care. <laughs>